Hello. When preservation conditions are favorable, archaeologists often find plant remains. These can range anywhere from charcoal and charred seeds, down through microscopic remains like phytoliths and pollen grains, down to chemical residues, and even isotopic signatures. In today's video, I'm going to introduce you very generally to the topic of archaeobotany, also called paleoethnobotany, which is the science of archaeological plant remains. In it, I'll focus mainly on how archaeobotanists recover plant remains and identify them, uh, and give you a very brief introduction to what kinds of things that they can learn from those plant remains about diet, climate change, and the environment around the site and the region within which the site was found. When we think of archaeobotanical remains, usually the first thing we think of is charred seeds. And it's true that these are an important source of evidence. Seeds and some other parts of plants, such as nutshell, are only preserved because they got close enough to fire to char them, but not close enough to be completely incinerated. The charring allows them to survive long periods of burial in the soil, but it also distorts their shape and makes them brittle, so that they're easily broken. Charring can also preserve wood in the form of charcoal. And archaeologists also sometimes find waterlogged wood or wood that's been preserved in very dry caves. But these pieces of wood provide very different kinds of information than the seeds do, such as what kind of wood people chose for fuel or construction purposes, or what kinds of trees may have existed in the neighborhood of the site. In some parts of the world, and especially the tropics, roots and tubers may be much more important food sources than seeds. Charring can also preserve these parenchymous tissues, but heating can also distort and damage the tissues in these parenchymous organs, which can make them more difficult to identify. There's also a very long history of finding very tiny traces of plants, mainly in the form of pollen. These microscopic pollen grains also provide very different sorts of information than would either charcoal or seeds. And they usually come from off-site locations, like the bottoms of lakes or bogs, rather than from archaeological excavations. Other microscopic traces of ancient plants come in the form of phytoliths. In some plants, these preserve the shapes of certain cells in the form of silica outlines, like these ones here from elephant grass. And today, Archaeobotanists even study starch grains found embedded in the tiny pores on the surfaces of artifacts. In cross-polarized light, starch granules show a distinctive Maltese cross. Archaeobotanists are also interested in indirect evidence for plant consumption through the ratios of carbon-12 and carbon-13 atoms in human and animal bones. Their ratios vary because of differences in photosynthetic pathways. And this type of evidence has been particularly important in the identification of early maize consumption. One of the challenges of archaeobotany is separating what are often very tiny and fragile plant remains from very large volumes of sediment. Dry screening the sediment through stacks of sieves is one way to do this, but in some cases it might damage the most fragile plant remains. For that reason and others, Archaeobotanists often use water to help them separate the plant remains. This takes advantage of the fact that many kinds of plant remains, notably charred seeds and husks and so on, float on water. The simplest version of this involves putting some sediment in a bucket of water and agitating it until some of the plant remains float on the top. You can then scoop up those plant remains with a small sieve, such as a tea strainer. The slightly more complex version you see here involves two nested buckets and the bottom of the inner bucket has been replaced by a screen. After placing some sediment in the inner bucket, you plunge it up and down in the water and twist it left and right in order to agitate the sediment and cause things to float to the top. You then carefully decant this froth into a sieve. After doing this several times, you empty the sieve onto a cloth and empty the material caught at the bottom of the inner bucket onto another cloth. That so-called heavy fraction can contain not only heavier plant remains, such as nutshell, but also might contain lithics or bone. You then tie up the cloths into small bundles 
attach a label to record the context, and hang them up to dry slowly. When archaeobotanists need to process very large volumes of sediment, they usually prefer to use a larger flotation tank that doesn't rely on their own muscles to agitate the sediment in the water. There are several different kinds of such tanks, and the version you see here uses pressurized jets of water to agitate the sediment. A mesh inside the tank captures the heavy fraction, and an overflow spout directs the froth into a nearby sieve that captures the light fraction. This version uses a lot of water, so in areas where water is in short supply, it's necessary to have a series of settling tanks so that you can recycle the water. It's possible to build a flotation tank like this one using basic plumbing supplies, but there are also several commercially available flotation tanks that you can buy. No matter what type of flotation you use, you need to be careful that each sediment volume is not contaminated by material from previous sediment volumes. When trying to identify charred seeds, whether they're whole or fragmentary, it helps to be familiar with the anatomical parts of a seed. In the case of a dicotyledon seed, like a bean, the main features are the hilum, the scar left where the bean was detached from its pod, a small bulge above the radical, which is the root portion of the embryo, and the micropile, a tiny hole through the testa that allows moisture to enter the seed. These features help you orient the seed when you're comparing it to reference specimens. On this kidney bean, the hilum is the most prominent feature on the dorsal surface. Thanks to the ways that humans process grain for storage and consumption, archaeobotanists don't just find charred grains, they sometimes also find other plant parts that are closely associated with grains, such as glooms or rachis internodes. We can see some of these features on these oat grains here. The grain at left is uh, mounted on a piece of plasticine to expose its ventral surface. The one at right retains its rachis internode and some gloom keels. The grain enclosed within the glooms, here illustrated with a wheat grain, has a prominent groove on the ventral side. The germ area on the dorsal side, which covers the embryo of the seed, helps us to orient the grain. Here you can clearly see the ventral groove, and here that germ area. Again, the grain at left is mounted on a piece of plasticine. In the case of maize kernels, we can also see the embryo quite clearly on the dorsal side. It shows quite clearly on the dorsal view at left. In the case of nuts, the part that is most likely to be preserved archaeologically is the hard endocarp, or nutshell, although archaeologists sometimes find the charred embryo or cotyledons of nuts like walnut, shown here. A number of structural features in wood are very important in the identification of charcoal, whose identification ideally involves examining it in the transverse, tangential, and radial views. The transverse plane is what we usually think of as a cross-section, and it allows us to view the tree rings quite well. You can also see some radiating line-like features, which are called rays. In transverse or cross-section, or the end view in logs or commercial lumber, it's usually easy to see the annual rings, made up of early wood with larger pores or cells, and late wood with slower growth and smaller pores. Rays intersect these at right angles, radiating outward from the center of the log or branch. Identifying tree species depends on variations in all these features and some others, some of which are unique to hardwoods or softwoods. Here we see an idealized block of hardwood, that is, wood from a deciduous tree, showing its radial, tangential, and transverse views. Some distinctive features include multiseriate rays, which in tangential section appear kind of like bundles that are wide in the middle and taper at the upper and lower ends. Another important feature is the presence of vessels, which are particularly noticeable in the transverse section as shown in the idealized hardwood at left, but absent from the softwood at right. In softwoods, that is, wood from coniferous trees, the only features that could potentially be confused with vessels are resin ducts, 
and in softwoods, the rays are unisariate, so that in tangential view, they don't noticeably bulge out in the middle, the way multiseriate rays do. When attempting to identify a piece of charcoal, you'll ideally want to observe fresh surfaces in the radial, tangential, and transverse planes. And you'll need to cut the charcoal along those planes using an X-Acto knife or a razor blade. As much as possible, you want to cut straight down and not use a sawing motion, because you don't want to damage the cell structure that you're about to observe. It may take several attempts to get a nice clean surface in which the cell structure is easily visible. This tangential section now looks pretty good, and the multiseriate rays stand out well. This transverse section is not too bad. But the radial section is not as clear as it should be. As you might expect, getting sections that make it easy to identify the wood is hampered if the piece of charcoal is too small. Now the radial section is somewhat clearer. When archaeobotanists need to count small particles on a slide, for example in pollen analysis, they sometimes use a sampling procedure called PPS sampling which stands for probability proportional to size. This involves using a reticle on the microscope to impose a grid of lines or points on the image. For example, here we have a mock-up of a slide with 25 pine pollen grains and 41 lycopodium spores. Palynologists use known numbers of so-called exotics, in this case lycopodium spores, in order to determine the total counts of the pollen grains. In a real example, the numbers of pollen grains would be much greater, making it impractical to count all of them, so we need to use some kind of sampling method. One option is to use a reticle with a grid of vertical lines, and to count every pollen grain or lycopodium spore that the lines intersect. Here I've circled the intersected pollen grains in red and the intersected spores in blue, and you can see that this sample yields a ratio of 13 pine pollen to 7 spores or 1.9. Alternatively, we could use a reticle with horizontal lines. In this case, we intersect 17 pine pollen and 9 spores, which also yields a ratio of about 1.9. Yet another option is to use a grid with both horizontal and vertical lines. This increases the number of intersections so that we find 20 pollen grains and 15 lycopodium spores. But notice that this time the ratio is 1.3 instead of 1.9. A fourth option is to use a grid of points, here represented by small crosses. Points yield fewer intersections than lines do, so this time we only have 8 intersections for pollen and 3 for spores, leading to the much higher ratio of 2.7. The problem with these varying results is all the more acute when we remember that at the beginning when we counted all the pollen and all the spores, we had a ratio of 25 to 41, or 0 0.6. The reason for these discrepancies is inherent in the name of this sampling method. The larger particles, in this case pine pollen, are more likely to be intersected by the lines or points than our small items like the lycopodium spores. So the ratios of counts that we make using this method will be biased if the particles vary in size, as they do here, because the pine pollen is four or five times the size of the lycopodium spores. The fact that the pine pollen is elongated and the lycopodium spores are circular is also a factor when we use line sampling. Consequently, to get accurate ratios or proportions of these particles, we need to correct for these effects. If you're going to use this method, you should consult the relevant statistical literature. Interpretation of archaeobotanical remains can be very complex because they're subject not only to the usual taphonomic processes that destroy and distort many of these remains, 
but because many human practices involving plants affect the probability that those plant remains will enter the archaeological record at all. In the case of grain and similar seed crops, processing that involves fire greatly enhances the probability that those seeds will become charred and thus able to survive burial in the ground for long periods. In addition, processes like threshing, winnowing, and sieving greatly affect the nature of the seeds and other plant parts that enter the archaeological record. The chart you see here outlines these processes for free threshing grain and their straw and is based on ethnoarchaeological work in Turkey by Gordon Hillman. Bolded boxes on the chart highlight those processes that involve fire, such as kiln drying or using chaff as fuel. One of the most common uses of pollen analysis is to study climate change and other environmental changes in a region. Typically, palynologists use cores through sediments at the bottoms of lakes, which they sample at depth intervals to see how the pollen varies over time. Occasional seeds or small bits of charcoal in the core can also provide carbon dates. Fluctuations in the relative abundance of various categories of pollen can be related to changes in tree cover or the extent of grasslands or agriculture, and indirectly of climate change, such as increased or decreased rainfall. But a number of factors also complicate our interpretation of these sequences. For starters, different species of flowering plants vary greatly in the amount of pollen they produce, and the pollen of some species can travel on the winds for hundreds of kilometers. So the presence of such windborne pollen in a lake deposit does not necessarily mean that the plants that produced it were anywhere near the lake. In addition, because these are relative abundances, the abundance in a particular category can appear to fluctuate even when its actual production rate was pretty constant, just because of fluctuations in the other categories. After all, they all have to add up to 100%. The accurate interpretation of pollen sequences therefore requires careful consideration of all of these confounding factors. Although there are manuals and atlases to help with identification, archaeobotanists are just as reliant as zooarchaeologists on their own reference collections. For seeds and the plant parts that typically accompany them, such as glooms and rachis fragments, you would want to include both uncharred and charred specimens, just as you'd want to include both wood and charcoal pieces. If you have the means to make them, it's an excellent idea to have thin slices of wood and charcoal in the radial, transverse, and tangential section mounted on glass slides. You would also have reference specimens of phytoliths and pollen mounted on slides. For many of the kinds of seeds you'd want to have in your reference collection, it's pretty easy to acquire them simply by visiting a bulk food store. So domesticates like what do we got here, oats, wheat, barley, uh, what do we got here? Soybeans and maize, those can all be found at bulk food stores very easily. Uh, sometimes you might have a bit more difficulty getting the varieties you want, but you'd be surprised what you can find at some of these stores. And there are also sometimes online resources you can check out to find, to find some of the kinds of seeds you want to put in your reference collection. In the case of wild uh, taxa, you'll usually have to do some field work to, to acquire those, and you'll need to know how to identify live plants at the time that they are seed bearing and acquire, acquire them by harvesting them yourself. To char some of the seeds, wrap them in aluminum foil to impede oxygen and then bake them in a lab oven. You'll probably need to experiment a bit to find the right combination of baking time and temperature in order to, to char the seeds but not reduce them to ash. You can sometimes also obtain specimens of wood for your reference collection simply by going to a lumber yard. And if you're really lucky, they'll be nice enough to give you some scrap pieces at little, for little or no cost as well. The downside of that, however, is that the way lumber is cut, sawn, and planed is not in the, in the planes that you would want for your reference collection, ideally. Uh, although the one that works well is the transverse uh, section, is just the end grain on most kinds of lumber. So the end of a piece of oak like this one, uh, you, can, you can see quite well, although Depending on the size of the piece of wood, it's not necessarily going to give you a very large view of that, uh, of that end grain. Uh, but uh, this is a piece of oak that's uh, quarter sawn, for example, and a quarter sawing uh, does not expose the grain in the way that you want to observe it uh, for scientific purposes, for which we'd want to have, in addition to the end grain or transverse view, we'd want to have the radial and tangential views. As its name suggests, quarter sawing involves sawing boards in each quarter of a log in the pattern shown here. 
To accomplish this, the sawmill begins by sawing the log in half and then placing it at an angle so that they can begin to saw off boards in one eighth of the log. They then rotate the log 45 degrees and saw some more boards in another one eighth of the log. Notice that the last board sawn here is actually a radial section, so we can expect a small proportion of quarter sawn lumber to give us radial sections as well as transverse ones. Um, sometimes they're planed in such a way as to give you a tangential view as well. But the, you know, the purpose of um, the lumber yard is to expose the grain in a way that looks attractive, not in a way that makes it easy to identify the species of tree from which it came. Um, here we have a transverse slice through a birch trunk. And you can see the, the tree rings uh, in this piece uh, quite nicely, so you have the darker uh, darker rings and lighter rings, with the darker ones being uh, early growth and the lighter ones being late growth uh, for this particular tree. But to see it properly, you really need to look at it under magnification. So here we have uh, a hand lens that gives us, uh, this one is 10 power hand lens. And, and that's enough to see the pores and so on in the, in the wood fairly well, although to get a good really good clean view of it because when this is sawn with a commercial saw it tends to roughen up the surface a bit. Again you might have to use a very sharp knife like an exacto knife in order to as carefully as possible and a, and a very sharp exacto knife you don't want an old one that's kind of dull uh, to slice off some of that surface as cleanly as possible so that you can see the cell structure of the wood a lot better. Uh, now that's easier to do uh, for some of the end views so again here we have transverse uh, view on the, uh, or the end grain of this piece of oak uh, which we could clean up a bit by slicing it with the exacto knife if we're lucky. Unfortunately the exacto knife is right out too far as bending. If you can do it so you make it cleaner as opposed to make, giving, causing even more damage. And if I want to get, let's see the grain here. If I wanted a tangential view, uh, this end of the floorboard comes pretty close to a, t a tangential view. So what I would want to do is pare away the wood in this view, just kind of trim it down. Uh, because of this groove here, it would take me quite a while to do that, or I, better yet, I would either saw or plane it down uh, to some degree and then, and then use the knife to, to make a clean cut on the edge to expose that tangential view a lot better. Of course there's a lot more to archaeobotany than I was able to cover in this short video and I encourage you to check out some of the links that I'm going to put at the bottom of this one to, so you can learn more about archaeobotany. You can also have a look at chapter 16 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, and some of the references I cite there to learn more. Thank you and stay safe.